We start the afternoon session on global governance mapped by top think tanks. And we have the um, leaders of world's think tanks here together with us. Um, at a time when the world is moving in a very exciting and exhilarating way. And today, we'll hear the thinking of uh, the world's leading think tanks and also uh, those people who lead those uh, think tanks. It is a unique opportunity to bring together a lot of different people with different ideas. And I must say that when I'm on a panel of think tanks, I'm not usually the only American. And you have to realize that the only American on this panel of think tanks is a pro-Trumper. So uh, I have to maybe put that into the context of what I'm about to say. You're absolutely right, Mr. Minister. The, the global governance system is uh, being challenged on a number of fronts. And yet at the very same time, we all saw in today's newspapers and last night's television a picture of President Moon and President Trump, which was the ninth summit between those two individuals in just the last three years. So it's not like Trump is a uh, isolationist. Yes, he talks about America first, but he's not America only. Uh, he is well known and uh, I think has mutual respect uh, exercised both from President Moon on the left and President Trump on the right, coming together with a, I think, a fairly shared view of how to deal with North Korea. Has North Korea been solved on the Trump, uh, on the Trump term? No, it hasn't. But I would argue that certainly there's been more progress made in terms of dialogue, in terms of looking at options, because disruptor Trump has changed the range of of what people can talk about when they talk about North Korea. And the fact that he's now had three summits with Kim Jong-un, I think is also very, very significant. And as I say, more progress than made under the past at least three administrations in both political parties in the United States. So it's a, uh, it's not a solved problem, but it's a problem that at least is on hold right now and from our perspective in Washington, we don't hear the kind of talk that we were hearing four or five years ago about, oh my gosh, South Korea is gonna want a nuclear uh, capability of its own and then so will Japan and that means that China will then be surrounded by 11 instead of only eight nuclear armed countries and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, the rhetoric is down a bit and perhaps we are on a way to actually trying to figure out as Moon and Trump said yesterday, in a step-by-step -step, uh, forward motion. Second thing I want to talk about very specifically is China. And what I'm about to say is something I've said in China on a number of recent occasions. So it's, it's not a surprise, I don't think, to any of my Chinese friends that I have pretty strong views on this. As Professor Niall Ferguson said this morning, the ultimate objective of Trump's policy toward China is not a, uh, a, a new establishment of tariffs or uh, that kind of dealing with trade. Rather, I think it has to do with a couple more fundamental factors. The first one, as Niall pointed out very strongly, uh, and I think my, my friend Justin Lin, uh, who I've been with on a number of occasions, did not really answer it adequately. In the United States, we go back to the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution says we will respect patents. And a patent is intellectual property. And if we, in our trade dealings, don't respect patents, don't respect intellectual property, if there's either forced transfer or it's just outright stolen, uh, that's not a good way to do business. And I'd argue that that's one of the fundamental issues that has to absolutely be confronted. Another argument that I have fairly often with my Chinese friends is that they say, well, of course, we might be the number two economy in the world, but we're still a developing country. And of course, being a developing country, it means that China, 
basically works with a different set of rules. They get subsidized loans from the international financial institutions. They don't have to respect private property and property rights the same way that a developed country has to. But to sit around a conference table and say, yes, for the next 50 years, the United States and China are going to be the two major economies in the world. We have to learn how to work together and get along together. Yes, we do. But then we really ought to be playing with the same set of rules, in my opinion. We can't have one side where they're basically kind of fudging at the margin with these. And those are the real kinds of issues that I think our Chinese friends and my American colleagues are going to have to come to grips with. Uh, my final thought, and we're very limited on time, I would just say, yes, Donald Trump is facing a re-election. We all know that. November 2020. I would maintain very vigorously that whoever wins the, the 2020 election whether it's Trump or whether it's one of the myriad of Democrat candidates who are out there right now, the U.S.-China relationship and U.S. international relations generally are not going to go back to the old status quo of the good old days under Obama, Bush, Clinton, when the United States was either a policeman to the world or a subsidizer of the world or the, person, the country that gets kind of the short end of the stick at WTO or whatever. And I say that as someone who, in my youth, uh, was very supportive of the notion of China coming into WTO. But again, 20 years plus later, if China's not obeying by, living by those rules, we have to take a re review of it, a reevaluation of it. And I think that will happen no matter who the next president is. Because if you read carefully, as my colleagues and I have to do, what's actually being said on the floor of the US Senate and I th I'm sure will be said even more in the future presidential debates on the Democrat side, we're not going to go back to the good old days because the United States is going to be a different kind of major, com major country in the, in the world, a different kind of leader, uh, one that, in fact, as Trump says, uh, looks out for our own interests first, and as he said on a number of occasions, most recently at the UN yesterday, uh, that's the way the new reality is going to be whoever is in the Oval Office. Thank you very much, Sanjo. Uh, so since we are totally free uh, in these initial remarks, I would like to make in a relatively provocative way a few uh, set of remarks so that we can uh, also feed the, the discussion in the second stage. Well, first remark on globalization itself. Those who believed a few years ago that uh, globalization would lead to a flat world where and are wrong. The world is not flat and it will likely be even less flat than it is today. That's my point number one. And technology does, will not change that. You know? And we could have, for instance, a fragmented uh, internet uh, and a fragmented uh, uh, co 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 a fragmented, connected world, uh, because techno technologically and politically it is feasible. That's my first point. Second, on US-China, I think we had an extremely interesting session uh, this the morning. Uh, the issue about US-China is, of course, much more than a trade uh, issue. That was extremely clear uh, this uh, morning. And uh, nobody can tell today where it will lead to. Just one point, in my humble judgment, uh, there is only one case where uh, we could have a direct confrontation uh, between the US and China in the foreseeable future. That is if uh, Taiwan uh, declared uh, unilaterally uh, independence and uh, perhaps if the case of Hong Kong degenerated in some way or another. A, apart from that, we are probably more likely to fall into the Kindleberger trap, which I will mention in a minute. My third point, which I hope is coherent with the first two, is that the world is more and more moving towards national populisms of all sorts, and uh, that is nationalist plus 
populism. And uh, you know, uh, uh, the concept of democracy with adjectives has flourished uh, in the last few years in the language of political scientists. And in particular, uh, the concept of uh, ethnic democracy. And that uh, was built for actually Ukra Israel to describe the, the situation in Israel. That is the situation where one part of the population, ethnic, more or less ethnically defined, is the dominant uh, part of the, of the country. And the other citizens are openly considered to be second-rate citizens. And the problem, of course, the case of Israel is very special. But uh, now I, I had a, a fresh look recently on the case of India, which I think is going to be discussed uh, in this forum uh, <coughs> tomorrow, I think, uh, so, somewhere. And Mr. Modi's uh, action, the BGP action, is exactly that, uh, to move the country towards, I mean, India, towards uh, a democracy, ethnic democracy, with huge number of consequences. But uh, with or without this uh, democracy, ethnic democracies, it's quite clear that nationalists is flourishing everywhere, especially when you have economic difficulties. For instance, clearly China is going through difficult situations internally, which were planned, which have been very well understood by the leadership for, for many years for objective reasons. And, but nationalism, I think, is, is part of this movement. And uh, it's not easy to see where it could lead to. It's, it's a complex situation. So uh, let me end this uh, initial uh, uh, round by uh, commenting uh, uh, a bit further on the Kindleberger trap. Now, everybody uh, knows about the Thucydides uh, trap, which has become famous uh, thanks by uh, Graham Allison. Uh, according to this uh, theory, uh, the rise of China would almost uh, uh, necessarily lead to some kind of major confrontation. I think many of us disagree with the blunt application of the uh, Thucydides trap theory. But uh, the smarter version of this is the Kindleberger, the Kindleberger trap. That is, the, the, the Kindleberger was, Charles Kindleberger was a famous uh, economist uh, in the United States. He studied particularly in depth uh, the, um, uh, the Great Depression of the, of the 30s. And the idea here is that uh, improper economic governance uh, can lead to situations which themselves can feed, combined with nationalistic, nationalistic uh, trends, can feed, uh, create the con proper condition for a real war. In other terms, according to that theory, if there is a risk some, sometime in the 20th century to have a major war of some sort, it would be through the degradation of the economic international system. And here, I think there is a very serious uh, concern. And uh, I think the economic uh, governance organization is, is still is, is very weak compared to the gravity uh, of the problems which we are facing ahead. The irony is, is uh... Brexit closes Britain down a bit. Chatham House is trying to keep its eyes global. Um, I, I will definitely come back to, uh, if I may, I'll just add on to Thierry's uh, comment about our various nationalisms at the end. But let me just take um, a few minutes to sort of get to the exam question. Just four points I wanted to make. One, um, as one of the institutes, Chatham House, the Royal Institute of International Affairs that was founded in the 1920s, in that period uh, immediately after the First World War, where people are trying to think, how do you avoid um, uh, that clash uh, between governments uh, leading to war again in the future? Um, as one of the institutions, along with others, that was involved then in trying to design institutions that would avoid war in the future, first being the League of Nations in the 1920s, which obviously failed, um, and then post-World War II, the Bretton Woods institutions, the UN, etc. cetera. Um, uh, we are an institution, I suppose, and I come from that generation that's been used to international affairs being managed through a set of institutions, Western ones, 
which dominated and which appeared to have succeeded um, in, should we say, winning the 20th century. Um, and I suppose the big shock for somebody like me as we wander up to our centenary next year is that actually as I look out to the world, it's got many of the echoes, as I'm sure everyone here would recognize, of that period of the 1920s and 1930s when we were founded. Um, and why is that? I mean, at, at a most basic level, uh, a lot of the crisis that emerged certainly out of the 20s and 30s um, was impacted by the Great Depression, by the drive to protectionism, by a turning inwards, by sauf qui peut, each country looking after itself, beggar thy neighbor policies. And it doesn't take much to look at some of the parallels today where after the global financial crisis, which certainly hit the West hard, very hard, other countries uh, build up some vulnerabilities through that process. We now find ourselves in a position where, you know, America looks a little bit like an America of the 1930s, saying the rest of the world uh, can look after itself. We need to look after ourselves. Um, and it's America first. The difference, of course, is that America is now undoubtedly the most powerful nation in the world, as President Trump reminded everyone in his UN speech last night. Um, but when America says America first, it's not like saying Germany first or Britain first or South Korea first or anyone first. When the most powerful nation in the world says me first, everyone else is put on notice because you can only be second, third, fourth or whatever. Um, and what worries me therefore is that uh, although I understand where that instinct came from, Neil Ferguson did a pretty good job at, at explaining it, I think from a Trumpian perspective as well, of the questions he's trying to answer. Uh, what we have seen uh, in this period is a complete collapse, or no, not a complete collapse, but certainly a weakening of the international institutions that have provided predictability uh, for the world for the last many decades. Now, second point, that puts us right into the China-US conflict, um, where the United States is trying to I think, you know, contain China's rise, again, for the reasons we heard this morning. I think Ed Fulner also uh, laid those out. Uh, China is, is a threat to many of America's interests, the interests of many countries around the world in terms of its rise, um, if it seeks to extend its own system uh, of influence or government to other countries. But what we're happening here is that the China-US standoff is forcing people to make decisions about where they stand at a time when I think they don't want to decide. The big question is if we're going into a new economic Cold War, which we heard about this morning, how big is the non-aligned movement going to be? Um, you know, there was a non-aligned movement last time. Naturally, you would expect that non-aligned movement to be pretty small this time around. The democracies would stand together. Um, uh, against China uh, uh, as a um, authoritarian, as a single state um, government, uh, which is so different from those in the West. But the fact is that America has been, uh, or at least the Trump administration in recent years, has been treating all of its allies a bit as either pawns or friends or partners, but really on US policy. It's not as if uh, Europeans get much of a word in on what the foreign policy is that they're meant to be pursuing. It should be America's foreign policy or there's no foreign policy. Um, and it's pretty shocking to see, to me, to see Europeans uh, and Americans so divided over uh, Iran as they have been uh, over recent years. Um, but that is just one example of a place where, uh, in essence, Europe is being asked to abandon its foreign policy and to pursue America's foreign policy, uh, which is something that's particularly difficult to do in these days. So we're being asked to choose. I think Japan, South Korea are being asked to choose as well. You can use Huawei as an example. But if the US administration sees every technology in the world that's emerging now as a dual use technology, then in essence, there's no scope for any kind of economic partnership with China going forward. Uh, the idea of coexistence uh, which was promoted, obviously, in the remarks we heard earlier this morning by the, the Chinese opening remark, um, is not one for the future. Now, third point, Europe has been, I think, relatively resilient so far in this. I'm, I'm not, even as a Brit, um, an EU basher on these things. Uh, Europe has continued to strike tri uh, trade deals around the world through this period. Um, it has continued to try to think about international regulation. Uh, general data protection and so on. It's actually trying 
finally to spend something on defense. I think at President Trump's quite correct urging, and it's an area where I think President Trump has done a very useful service uh, to Europe. It's held together over Iran. It's held together so far over Russia. I say so far. What I would say is looking forward to the next year or two, there are signs of fragmentation, at least on the foreign policy front. Uh, France may be leaning a little bit more forwards towards Russia at a moment of German weakness. Uh, Boris Johnson, uh, depending how long he remains president, certainly some prime minister, certainly flirting with the idea of maybe taking a different approach to Iran. And if we look at Asia, we see other allies, South Korea and Japan, uh, fracturing a little bit themselves. Um, I don't think the European Union is going to fragment, however, despite Brexit. What it's more likely to do is perhaps turn on itself a little bit more and become a Europe that is more about protecting Europeans from this instability that I've described rather than the other way around. All I would say is this world presents huge to close challenges to think tanks, as we are representatives of think tanks. Um, you know, do we pick sides in a world of interdependence? I think you, the world could afford a Cold War in the 20th century. Personally, I don't believe the world can afford a Cold War in the 21st century, where climate change will not be fixed by any one country or two countries, has to be fixed by everyone together, where Africa's development will not be able to be delivered only by Europe or by the United States. It will need Chinese and other participation as well. So I suppose I'm one of those people who hopes that division does not uh, persist uh, right through and fragment us as think tanks at a time of such great challenge. After Brexit, will Britain remain in splendid isolation or uh, will it find a partner to go along, a partner such as the United States, uh, no matter what the, uh, the hierarchy within that partnership is? That's a big and good question. I'll try to be quick, again, just not to take up too much uh, time from, from the Chinese perspective. I think we've got to remember that Europe at the moment, uh, sorry, the United Kingdom is uh, psychologically schizophrenic. It is caught between the Britain that Thierry described, for whom not being part of the European Union was the definition of Britain's national identity. Uh, which I totally recognize. Europe, Brits get emotional about Europe when they're against it, rather than being emotional about it when they're for it. Um, but I think as we've seen through the referendum and in the period after, there are two generations in the United Kingdom. Um, and it's not entirely 100% on one side or the other. But you could say under the age of 40, Britain, I think, has become European. And over the age of 40, it remains what de Gaulle new from the 20th century. And so to answer your question, if Britain leaves the EU, it's still an if, not, I'm, I'm just factually it's an if because who knows what's gonna happen in the next few months. But if it leaves the EU, and I'd be with you, that's my assumption. Um, if it leaves with a no deal Brexit, if there's a deal that is a schism, that is a cathartic Brexit, which is what many of the high priests of Brexit in the British parliament and outside it want, then I think that division in Britain's national character will persist for a long time and will really hold it back. If Boris Johnson or his successor or whomever can strike a, a deal for the future where the UK remains close to the European Union, which I think is entirely feasible, then actually I think Britain's national psyche will resolve itself to being close to the European Union, but not being of the European Union. And actually that probably would be the most comfortable place for Britain to be and for its national identities to coexist. Um, where it leaves Scotland and Ireland and Northern Ireland is incredibly important as well. If there was a no deal Brexit again, I think you're less likely to have a United Kingdom united in the next several years. So these next few years are consequential for what the United Kingdom is a country um, I will not naturally go back to being America's first partner. That is not its natural state for the future. Thank you, uh, Professor Khan. It's truly my big honor to join this distinguished panel uh, discussing a very timely issue. I will be make my presentation goes very, very precise and concise. First of all, I see 
Um, for example, global governance now really just like hitting a big snack. Reason is, I think we all know, so uh, international relations just uh, getting into a new cycle. Such a cycle is American as uh, uh, first and also only uh, dominant power is completely shifted the course. Traditionally, we see U.S. is inspiring source on how China just evolve ourself. But now when uh, uh, some sort of a trade or based such a very nasty push and turning into some sort of a new code wars, we say uh, such an attempt, then I see my country is back down. So from the beginning, I see the Cold War, uh, trade war, I think the push from Washington DC partly could serve a wake up call because China basically is a very conservative power. Such an international pressure could always play a constructive role to get to China moving ahead. But now since it's totally getting worse. So President Trump also proved he's not just a, some sort of personal antic a uh, starish guy, but his uh, mentality and the value of international relation is very disgraceful because the world is more globalized. But if we follow his uh, remarks at the UN last night, then we we'll see it's the first time President Trump very adequately proclaimed his value is anti globalist. It's really, really stunning me and shocking me. Without the globalization, without the globalists, we say uh, value conviction, how we can just uh, still put the global governance in position. As my colleague very powerfully demonstrate, without the global governance, the world where we're heading on, the more disastrous. Even just uh, given some sort of uh, such a horrible deterioration of emission emission gas emission and other things. So then I have to tell you in the past two decades, what kind of a fantasy I really figured out from deterioration for our bilateral relations with Washington is theoretically and practically as a professor of international relations, we always believe US is a benign hegemon. But now it's totally, no, it's totally not. No hegemon is benign. We have to get illusioned from that kind of assumption. The second, I see uh, the moving forward with the uh, global governance is highly required task force for all the countries. But the first thing is we need to overcome unilateralism and protectionism. We saw all such as some sort of the, uh, we say uh, protectionism and uh, unilateralism on the way. There's no help at all for us to just the way say come after very powerfully and very, very collaboratively on any issue given global governance. For example, China US trade friction. I think, yes, uh, as I mentioned, uh, China is a very conservative power. So then the trade war, partly from the beginning, could just uh, help evolving the Chinese ball and uh, get China move forward. But now, for example, some sort of uh, demands from the U.S. is inherently totally unacceptable. First is a policy narrative. Trump completely say China steal the job and is, uh, is a technology theft and also making advantage of the American's market. Is that true? In the past three decades, how China could export the goods to U.S. in some sort of such a great quantity of goods and to low, we say, prices, uh, we say, the goods. The reason is, uh, most important reason is American transformation of its economic growth. It's become the financial capitalism. So most of the manufacturing uh, has been uh, significantly outsourced. But at the same time, China happened to be most successful industrial power in the world. So it's not a China just the house say, forcefully US buy the Chinese goods. It's just the Americans transformation of its economic growth. Then 80% of Americans GDP is, you know, the financial asset operation. So then manufacturing is just left less than 11%. It's China's fault. No, 
but we'll never take it uh, as some sort of uh, reasonable. The second is, in the past three decades, when China just has a bumping up of machinery to offer the U.S. with a good quality of, we say, cheap and good quality uh, goods, how many environmental deterioration left for Chinese? We also consider it's industrialization curse. We also believe it's American financial capitalism to keep the China well exploited. But now, we cost us so much, then just to get the American accusation, it's the Chinese, some sort of mistake, get to the US uh, uh, falling into some sort of enlarged inequity. No, we consider such a, we consider such a scapegoat is really, really unacceptable and malicious. Finally, how China could just has a remove our uh, developing country status. It's not a, such a develop, developing country status. It's not a China's self-fulfilled. It's a, a WTO regulated. On the other hand, if you just examine the, uh, our South Korean's you know, policy, uh, Seoul also very strongly defend the uh, developing uh, economy status. Which one is better developed, China or South Korea? China is better. Then the China still adhere to the line of a developing country status. How can China just uh, have say kneel down to the US over such request? So my last word is, that's getting back to the great power competition. Don't just put the China at the opposite. Otherwise, there's no way we can just move ahead as you expected. Thanks. The World Knowledge Forum.